Well, thank you all so much for coming today to hear me talk, but obviously to, to be at this conference. What a great vibe. Um, this is my first time here uh, at Security Onion, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make it to uh, B-Sides Augusta, although I am going to make it a plan to be here next year and just chill and hang out. Uh, I always, uh, Q4 for me is the, the most insane with Cybersecurity Education Awareness Month and everything else. I'm always flying around. I literally uh, Monday flew to Oregon, uh, spoke to uh, Oregon State University, the kids, the faculty, uh, things like that, because education, teaching the next generation of kids is super important to me. I uh, literally flew back the next day, so I, I, got, I got done speaking at like 9.30 at night, woke up at 2 a.m., because that's like, like because I'm an idiot, where, how I book my flights, but then I flew back home, and as I'm landing, I got my check-in notice to come to, to Augusta. So, um, you know, I'm headed back home for the family and kids, but uh, such an honor to be here, and I promise I'll stay a little bit longer next time. Uh, today's talk is an important one for me. Um, a little bit of a background on my experience. You know, I came from the, the military side of the house. I was in the military intelligence side. I worked for the NSA doing cyber warfare. Deployed twice to Iraq for intelligence-related missions, Af Bahrain and Afghanistan as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, I learned really quickly a lot of the technical components uh, of cybersecurity, and I was really fortunate to come into, you know, the private sector and kind of an emerging field of what we know for cybersecurity. What's interesting is that uh, I failed out of high school. I had to go to summer school just to pass because I was always tearing apart computers and figuring out how they worked and coding and things like that. And I'm like, ah, why do I need this, this school thing? My parents were like, listen, you gotta stop spending time on computers, you're not gonna be successful. And I ultimately got the last laugh uh, on them, so I definitely shoved it back to my parents. Um, but I started two companies in the basement of my house. I got out of the military, I eventually became the chief security officer for Diebold, and uh, I lived my life uh, based on my gut. It probably sounds horrible, uh, but it works for me. So at Diebold, uh, I was one of the youngest uh, chief security officers in history. Uh, I was a VP, 26 years old, Fortune 1000 company, they were insane. I don't know why they put promote money in the first place, but it worked. And uh, you know, for me, it's always about making an impact with anything that I touch. And at Diebold, you know, they had stopped patching for two years because they didn't want to impact the business. This is you know, 2009, 2010. Uh, you know, no real formalized security program. And I came in. And I'm like, listen, you know, we're going to go balls to the wall here and do a lot of uh, crazy things. And um, and we did. Um, in 2009, we were one of the first companies to implement Cisco's ICE, so identity-based access control. Uh, NAC down to the switch port level. Uh, I did a, a, a change, so if everybody's familiar with ITIL, right, I got ITIL change control. Uh, great, great idea and concept, but man, it could get really slow to get things approved, especially if you have to go through like a change advisory board and change control board. So I got to be really good friends with uh, the network security, or the network engineer folks that weren't part of my team, and I'd buy them beer and pizza, and uh, one day I'm like, hey, there's kind of this RFC that looks a little bit like what I want to do, can I tuck this underneath there? And my one buddy's like, nah, man, that's gonna, that's gonna break the whole company. And I'm like, all right, let's go to the next guy. So I went to the, the next guy, Scott, who now works for me. And uh, I was like, hey, Scott, and what we're trying to do is, this is uh, 2010, you know, egress filtering, especially command and control, you know, typically going out 80, 443, 53, 21, whatever. Uh, what I was trying to do is, is block all egress ports across a global Fortune 1000 company uh, and we were proxy chaining ScanSafe at the time, which has towers. We were proxy chaining 8080 out. So we had no ports allowed outbound from 80 and 443. And I wanted to make this change company wide. I knew it was going to take like a year or two to do and testing and everything else. I'm like, ah, eh, we'll just figure it out. And so I tucked it in that RFC. We, 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 uh, we did literally across the entire company. We broke our entire manufacturing process for a day. Um, but I was good with the, the, uh, the, the EVP there and I had a really good relationship. And we actually knocked it out and it came, it actually worked successfully. So we literally were one of the only Fortune 1000 companies in that time to have all egress filtering, outbound, no C2 ability. Uh, we did uh, HTTPS or you know, uh, SSL termination. So it was breaking um, uh, any type of, of C2 across the board. So it was awesome to be able to be part of that and making a huge change and impact in there. But uh, one day I decided to start my own company in the basement of my house. I left a perfectly great job at Diebold. Uh, you know, had a great team of 55 folks globally. And I was like, hey, I went to my, my wife, who just had kids, uh, or sorry, just had twins, and I'm like, hey, I wanna leave this awesome Fortune 1000 job that I'm doing really well at and start my own company in the basement of my house. And we have like, we have like six months of rent, we'll be good. And she's like, whoa, whoa, what? what, what are you saying? Like, you're doing great over here. I'm like, yeah, but I, I'm gonna trust my gut and I think I could do it, I think I could do it better over here. And 
didn't take any VC funding, just started literally grassroots, and uh, now Trust Attack has over 150 folks worldwide. I started a second company, Binary Defense, uh, and we have over 350 employees worldwide, uh, and we're growing leaps and bounds. Uh, and so, literally, uh, trust your gut and go all in, and if you believe in yourself, you can be successful literally at anything you do. I had no idea what I was doing, by the way, like how to register an LLC, what benefits are like, like no idea. Didn't read anything, just like, I'll figure it out. And uh, so it ends up working because you figure it out as you go along. So it's kind of my, my spiel on life. I want to give a special shout out to Security Onion. What an amazing thing. This is, to me, what this industry and community is all about. You know, a, a, a place where you're focusing on the community aspects and be able to provide to everybody, as well as being able to build a successful business and to help people out uh, while doing it. That's awesome. Uh, so to all the folks at Security Onion for having me, to Doug, I've known Doug for a number of years. Uh, incredible human and individual. This place has an awesome vibe. So truly a pleasure to be here and my honor to, to be with you guys. And Phil, congratulations on the, the weight loss, man. That is amazing. The last couple things here. Um, that's my wife. She's my CFO. She is amazing because I would just be like, hey, we're just going to offer all of our services for free. Um, and so she's my good balance to, to everything. Uh, she's like, hey, we need to make money off this. I'm like, why? We're doing, we're doing fine, right? And she's like, yeah, but eventually we're not going to do fine if we don't have any money. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So she's a great balance to that, um, and we, we work really well together. Surprisingly, it does work uh, really well. So, um, But I wrote the book, Metasploit, the Penetration Testers Guide. I wrote the Social Engineer Toolkit, Magic Unicorn, a number of exploitation frameworks. I was on the Kali Linux slash Backtrack development team, um, Exploit DB team. Wrote a lot of the modules in Metasploit, uh, a lot of zero days and stuff like that back in my heyday. I got too hard, so I started working on social engineering. So it, uh, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, really just trying to make an impact on this industry. A couple, couple funny things. I helped out the TV show Mr. Robot. So I work, worked with Rami Malek and Christian Slater, uh, doing a lot of the stunts and skits that you saw within the TV show. I've testified in front of Congress, and I've been in a Chris Brown rap video. <laughs> yeah, I saw it, I was like, what? Yeah, yeah no kidding, what? I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, but I, I, uh, the producer for the, the music video was like, hey, I know you're like this like hacker guy. Can you come in and like do all of the special effects? We want like cool like glitching screens and like binary code and stuff flying around. And and I'm like, sure, but you know I, I need to be in the video. And he's like, oh, uh, okay. So literally, if you watch, if it's not safe for work, but if you ever look up Chris Brown and Zoe Dalla's uh, uh, post and delete, uh, basically Chris Brown breaks up with his girlfriend and he wants a hacker to remove that they ever existed together on the internet. Um, and there's, there's me back in the background with a little, you know, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi and some like really old school looking um, hacker layer type stuff because that's what all hackers do, like old school, you know, uh, uh, tube TVs and glitching stuff everywhere. That's exactly what, what we portrayed. So it was pretty cool. And last but not least, uh, really quick, uh, we sponsored the Browns and the and the and the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers. I know I'm going to probably get a lot of Browns jokes. Blah blah blah. I gotcha. Um, you know, there's a lot of analogies in this, um, but you know, to come from uh, where I came from, uh, I came, you know, grew up very, uh, a very great loving family, but, you know, on the lower income side of the house, I was in the inner city side of, uh, side of schools, uh, you know, uh, not, not great areas to be able to, you know, start something from scratch and build it up is, is pretty awesome. And uh, I, my whole focus is giving back, so it's not announced yet, but it will be soon. Uh, one of my big missions, I, I took over the, or I'm on the technology board for Bedford High School, which uh, the net medium income average is under 30,000, which is well within the poverty levels within the United States. And um, so we, I built their eSports gaming, it's where I graduated from, uh, I built their eSports gaming facility, which created 15 new scholarship opportunities a year, now it's up to 27, and now it's going to be announced in the next couple of weeks um, that Trust the Tech has been working with Bedford to build a 9th through 12th grade cybersecurity program uh, where these kids can literally come out of that. We're going to help place them into other uh, schools, or uh, sorry, other companies without college degrees, as well as into trusted sec for internships to really kind of break that cycle. Because these kids have no technology, they have no computers at home, they have no ability to, uh, and we can go there. And I just got done talking to the kids last week, and to see their eyes light up when you say, hey, you can literally come into an industry, be successful, and make six figures, they don't even know what that means. They don't even know what that looks like. You know, it's, it's really cool to be able to have an impact on community as well. This was also last week, by the way, I got to party with Diamond Dallas Page, which is insane. Um, long story, it's a beer story, but uh, I have that belt now, and it's in my, it's in my gym, it's a PR belt, uh, so it's a lot of fun, but I'm actually hanging out with Diamond Dallas, he's actually from, uh, from uh, um, Georgia, so I'm going to be hanging out with him in a couple weeks, which is kind of crazy. Last but not least, before we kick off, um, my health journey is an interesting one. If you're interested in the whole health side, um, I came from this, 
So I uh, started off at uh, 322 pounds, uh, and I've been obese my entire life. And my doctor, I, I had a heart surgery done, and my doctor basically said, hey, you're way too young to be having heart surgery. If you don't make changes, you're not going to be around for your kids. And that kind of jolted me into focusing on my health and fitness. And I run a podcast with my personal trainer, uh, and he, it's amazing. We talk about the basics all the way to just get, how you start off to making changes that are small that impact large. We've had a huge success in helping a lot of folks in this industry with it. Um, and so I went from that to this, and that's, you know, I love that guy before. He's an amazing dude. Uh, you know, big Dave, but I'm a different, bigger Dave. Uh, and same guy, just different body now at this point. And what's been best about that is my kids now uh, are reaping the benefits from that, you know? Man, if I was that age and I knew how to lift, can you imagine how big I'd be now? Damn it. You know, like, totally missed out. My, I, and I keep, I keep telling them I'm jealous. My boy here on the left just hit a new PR, and you know, he's wearing the, the, the rock belt, the, the brawny belt, and it's pretty awesome. So if you're interested, there's a blog post I did back in 2020. It's a 40-minute read. I guarantee you, uh, if you implement those things, it'll completely change your life. It's not keto. It's not a, a pill. It's not anything else. It's literally how you make lifestyle changes and the science behind our bodies, uh, which is really important for me to understand. I'm a big data person, so um, it was really cool to be able to do that. So I'm going to kick off this with... Why are we here today? Well, the big issue that we find out today is cybersecurity is growing, right? Which is great. This industry continues to grow. We continue to expand. But why is that? Why do we continue to see an absolute massive increase in cybersecurity spending across the board? Well, because we're getting breached still, right? There's a lot of risks out there. Uh, ransomware groups, you know, business email compromises. Did you know that uh, business email compromises are up over 170% this year? Why is that? Does anybody know? A lot of money there for sure. Well, think about this. What was the bar of entry to do business email compromises? What would you have to be able to do to do business email compromises? Aside from low grade, social engineering, things like that. What's, what's the thing you had to do? Bank accounts, okay. You had to have a translator. You had to speak English, right? What came out recently? Chat GPT. So now we have the ability to have a full translator, English translator at our disposal, which completely knocks out the ability to have a native English speaking person to do the social engineering for you, including voice, by the way. Did you hear about the, you know, the MGM breach? That was all done via a voice translator uh, on the phone, via AI, to allow them to sound intelligible, no Russian accent, definitely in Russia. Um, they'll deny it, but it's definitely in Russia. Um, and so you, know, you look at that and you're like, well, hey, how's that going to impact the rest of the industry? So I did a, a, a news article on C or I did a TV interview at, at CNBC just the other day. I wanted to play it really quick because it'll kind of kick off the theme of, of what I'm talking about today. We continue on Power Lunch to follow those uh, uh, cyber casino attacks, cyber attacks on casinos, and then and seniors have both been hit by ransomware, uh, leading to massive system outages at MGM and reported 15 When you own your own company, you get to make your own titles. It's awesome. So obviously a good one right there, right? Um, and what's interesting with casinos, uh, they would rather pay the PCI fines than be compliant with PCI. You know, they don't care. It's like, hey, here's $50 million. If I shut down my casino or I have an outage, that's $50 million I'm going to lose in a day. So you know, they look at it from the perspective of, well, what's, what's the risk to the business? And there's, here's the thing, though. Think about that. We all laugh at that because, like, why, why the hell would they do that? But at the end of the day, cybersecurity is just a small fraction of a business's total risk, right? 
So who am I to say they're doing the wrong thing if it's you know, what's best for them to be able to be profitable uh, within their organizations or companies? I mean, obviously from our side, we'd be like, hey, that's, that's dumb. You, you at least need to like, do a little bit of security. Like if you do an M&A, you probably shouldn't just be like, I'm sure they're good and put them on your network and you have this flat network architecture that literally causes this massive outage, right? Now the, the thing that's crazy about MGM is they were losing an estimated 50 to $100 million a day with this outage, a day. And they probably would have gotten away with Caesars type ransom with 15 to 30, 40 million dollars, but they didn't pay. Did anybody see the, the post on LinkedIn for, for the MGM Linux admin? Oh my God. It was like, hey, we need temporary contractors for the next six months, expect to be working seven days a week, no days off until we're operational. What in the hell? Like what, right? I mean, it's a lot of money. I mean, I probably work seven days a week as a Linux admin rebuilding stuff, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Like, uh, I literally don't have to talk to anybody. I can just be rebuilding servers all day. I don't have to run businesses. I don't have to deal with kids. I mean, sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, but <laughs> it's like, you know, that's a perfect drop for me. Um, but why wouldn't they pay the ransom? That's a good thing, by the way, because every time we pay ransom, these groups just then increase sophistication levels. They get more notoriety, which means that they have better affiliates that are coming in to support their business models. And we have this cyclical effect of these adversaries getting bigger, 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 bigger. Now, really quick funny story about this. Um, in the back uh, right of me, uh, you can see I have the Rainbow Series books from the NSA. Uh, those are my favorite, if you look really closely. Second, though, um, in my other interview that I did, and you can catch this online, but uh, does anybody, you know, for the guys out there, have you ever done an impulse buy and you didn't tell your wife on, on it? Every single person's hand should be raised because you're, you're just kidding yourself, right? So the other, the other uh, couple weeks ago, I decided to buy a commercial grade hot dog maker. Um, I don't know, man, I was just feeling hot dogs at that time, okay? And I'm like, well, you know, you, when you order it, you get the buyer's remorse after you're like, crap, how, where am I gonna hide this so that my wife doesn't see I bought a commercial grade hot dog maker? And you start panicking and you're like, well, I, you know, well, it's a box, so she's not gonna know that when the box comes, it's gonna be an issue. And all these steps go through your mind, right? Um, and so um, I'm at work and it gets delivered. And I get a text message saying, commercial grade hot dog maker, WTF. It says on the whole box, it says commercial grade hot dog maker, literally on the damn box. It's not like a, just a packaged box. I'm like, who does that, by the way? I've never seen that. So she, now she knows I got this hot dog maker and she's totally pissed at me. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm gonna make the best of this. So I start taking pictures and selfies with this hot dog maker. Like I bring it to work, I'm cooking hot dogs at work. You know, like me and the kids are all having fun eating hot dogs. She's still mad at me and I'm put it, putting it on social media. She's like, stop sending pictures of the hot dog maker. You know, so she's getting really frustrated. Well, uh, on one of the CNBC news uh, interviews from two weeks ago, I'll have to, if you go to the, the Trusted Sec uh, YouTube channel, you'll see it there. Uh, but I decided to put, so she's in the, she's in the, she, she, <laughs> she's in the living room watching the news interview with all the kids. And I literally bring the hot dog maker and I'm cooking hot dogs live on CNBC. Um, and I can hear her yelling, is that the effing hot dog maker in the background? Are you serious? So then there's a picture shortly after where she conceded and she's like, okay, the hot dogs are pretty good. So it's got a picture of her and I with the hot dog machine. So that's what marriage is all about. So it's all, it's all about figuring each other out. All right, um, wanted to give a shout out to my, my late friend, Kevin Mitnick. He was a, a gr good friend of mine. He just recently passed uh, from pancreatic cancer. Uh, Kevin and I go a long ways back and uh, Kevin's an interesting uh, person because even up until his death, that dude was hacking. Like no one knows how methodical and obsessed and passionate he was about hacking. Uh, he literally was uh, uh, asking me like, like 10 times a day for, my pa uh, for, for uh, a hard drive with all my password lists on it so that he could, you know, he got this new GPU cracking cluster. It was like 70, 40, 90 TIs. And uh, he wanted us to get the, the list over to him. We worked back and forth. So, you know, I uh, wanted to give a shout out to him, but Kevin um, was, a, was a great human. And uh, this is a, a quote from a number of years ago, but when we were doing hacking, us older folks here, um, hacking was, was for fun, it was for information. You didn't have the weaponization of business models as you did. Now you always had cyber warfare, right? We've been doing that since World War II, World War I, pretty much the, the dawn of history and technology we've been doing this, right? The Enigma machine and breaking the encryption to be able to understand what's going on from the Germans. You know, so all of these things have been culminating to this point but it's never been to the point where the profitability margins on things have gotten the way that it has. So ransomware is definitely a major issue. And so now we have a problem uh, in this industry, which is the attackers see the value of, of, of investing in themselves in their R&D. They see the investments that they are getting that are having direct returns. And they're no longer targeting small, you know, small to medium sized businesses. They're going after large organizations. Obviously we see MGM, we see Caesar, we see all the breaches that we see out there. Um, you know, and and 
the, the person that was in charge, well, the person that hacked MGM and Caesars, the group, they're an affiliate group, right? So everybody understands kind of how ransomware works, right? So you have usually one or two or a small, tiny group of really sophisticated, I say really sophisticated, but decent hackers that can build uh, command and control infrastructure, they can build ransomware as a service models, they can build encryptors and decryptors, the help desk side of the house, right? They're, they're brilliant at the coding pieces and understanding, hey, maybe you have CrowdStrike or Sentinel One or you have Splunk, you know, I need to make sure my detections, or obviously Security Onion, um, you have, uh, I know you have that in your environment, uh, what can I do to get around that and then sell that out to less sophisticated hackers so now you have an army of hackers that focus on going after it. So what's interesting about uh, the MGM slash Caesars attacks is that it came from a group that's really good at social engineering, okay? Um, so they literally call people up on the phone, they, they said they spent 10 minutes by the way before they got direct access into to MGM, think about that. MGM, multi, multi billion dollar company, 10 minutes to break into a casino, right? Through a lot, you know, through through uh, cybersecurity methods or through hacking. So the the group that's in charge of that, though, the one that actually wrote that C2 infrastructure, the whole weaponization pieces, is also the group that did Colonial Pipeline. I uh, wrote the code for Colonial Pipeline. So Dark Matter slash Black Hat um, when they did Colonial Pipeline. Colonial Pipeline wasn't hacked by those individual people. It was again another affiliate, um, and they got into Colonial Pipeline. So we see these groups that now have access to heavily researched. C2 infrastructure, weaponization of tooling. Uh, if you looked at the Conti leaks that happened a number of years ago, um, you know, uh, those are predominantly in Russia. And when the Ukrainian conflict kicked off, Conti was based out of Russia, and they had an estimated around 200 to 250 employees, which is crazy. You think about that. You have an illegal organization that has, you know, a, a well methodical, well run business. Uh, they have help desk tiers, troubleshooting, they have standard operating procedures, they work on research and development to improve their tooling and weaponization. Uh, but what they didn't think about is that, you know, they, uh, when the, the Ukrainian conflict kicked off, Conti came out very pro-Russian, saying, you know, Ukraine's gonna fall, we hate Ukraine, anybody that supports Ukraine, you're against us, as Conti. Well, they didn't realize they had Ukrainian employees. Yeesh, oops. So all the Ukrainian employees got pissed off, started working with law enforcement, and they dumped all of the data um, from Conti. So we got to see a lot of internal operations of how these ransomware groups. Now, my favorite one is there was an attacker that uh, got stuck on a Linux machine, and he was asking the help desk folks, the, the, the hackers help desk folks, he's like, and the translation from like Russian to United States, or to, to English was like, hey, um, how the hell do I get out of this, you know, spawn of Satan editor, and they were in VI. Um, so they couldn't figure out how to get out of VI, so I thought that was the, the, the coolest thing ever, because Nano is definitely better than VI in, in many cases, so um, I figured I'd start off the, the talk strong. So to look at, at where we have problems, we kind of got to look at where we started. So, you know, I, I came in this industry, uh, you know, I started my military intelligence career doing cyber warfare in, the, in, in early 2000. And then, you know, from there, this industry kind of grew. Um, social engineering really wasn't a big, wasn't a, wasn't a thing at all. Uh, 2003, 2004, 2005. Kevin did a little bit early on, but it wasn't coupled with technology. And I remember, you know, being on the offense in the 2000s. Does anybody remember the, the, the glory, we, we call it the glory days, you know, in the early 2000s? Man, you can go into, if you knew how to hack a little bit, you would walk into a company, you would destroy them the first like 10 minutes, and then you like have the rest of the week off doing whatever you want to. So how do you think I wrote like the social engineer toolkit and all this other stuff? Because I was on a customer site where I have like all these test instances that I could basically test and prod, and you know, I, I'd hack this company, have full access to everything within like the first day, I'd write the report you know, at night in the hotel room, and then I'd have like five days of just having fun. You know, it was like, it was, like the greatest time ever, and then you'd walk in, you'd be like, hey, I did some magic stuff, here you go, here's your report, and then everybody's like, man, this, this guy's a magician, amazing. Like we were this mystique offensive side of the house. But that was such a rudimentary early on days of cybersecurity because what we were doing is just giving them a list of things to go and fix. Knock this, knock this, knock this. So hey, you have MS 8 6 7 or you have you know, some sort of remote code execution vulnerability or you have to patch this system or you have to change this default password. We weren't focusing on what actually happens when they're successful, recognizing that an attacker is always gonna be successful. You go into a company that has 2,000 people you know, and I, and I fail on the first social engineer, what am I gonna do? I got 1,999 more people to go. 1,998. You know, and I'm gonna figure out what works, what doesn't, the lingo I have to, if you're comfortable on the phone, man, you can spend all day, and I guarantee within one day you have a successful something, right? And, you know, so we have exposure. Does anybody here feel like they've addressed all exposures in their organization? Does anybody here feel like they have enough people dedicated to cybersecurity? Do you feel like you have enough money dedicated to cybersecurity? We, right, so I, I had the fix by the way. So the fix for cybersecurity, and I'm, I'm gonna give it to you all now for free because it's all about community. 
is that if you're able to dedicate one cybersecurity person to every one employee, we'd be fine. <laughs> It'd be good. You could sit behind Bob and be like, dude, don't click, he clicked it, okay, hang on, let me get your computer, pass it over to Rachel, Rachel's like, oh yeah, Rachel, I'm gonna give it to, give it to Jim, and then you image the machine, you're good to go. Your response times would be incredible, right? Low risk, no, literally know everything that's going on, there's a new project over here, or you know, HR is gonna go purchase a new CR, you know, a new HR tool in the cloud, cool beans, I'm, like, I'm right, right there watching that, It'd be perfect. So we could solve security today just by hiring one person for every one employee. But we don't have that, where'd I go, there we go. But we don't have that, and so we're slow. And what I mean by slow is that we all work in an organization, I'm sure, where we have some sort of security strategy, right? Some governance program where we're implementing policies and structure, and we're always revising those, and we are building these programs out like incident response and detection engineering and monitoring and detection and vulnerability management and, you know, uh, DLP. Uh, you know, all these different things that we have to do in an organization that takes a lot of time. Has anybody here ever been able to implement allow listing or application control within a few weeks of being in the company? Hell no, that ain't happening. It takes time, right? You gotta understand the business, you gotta deploy it kind of a monitor mode, you gotta look at that, you gotta put seven gazillion uh, exceptions in place uh, because you, know, you have not, no standardization across your entire organization. And so this stuff takes time. But we gotta secure them now, don't we? we? We have to secure our companies now because we're so far behind already, where are we gonna go in the future? And even if we, by the way, get to a state where we're secure, it never happens, right? So we're continuously working on the next three years, and the next three years, and then like AI comes down, like, oh my God, we gotta blow up our entire security program and start from scratch with AI. And then we gotta get rid of all of our tools that we invested in, that we have all the intellectual property and, and, and knowledge in, and go next generation. So the, the folks that were amazing at Cisco, Cisco for 15 years of experience, the best network ninjas you've ever seen before, we're gonna unplug that Cisco and go Palo Alto because it's next generation. So we have these complexities that we deal with every day and it's not cut and dry, right? If we could just, does anybody here not have to go to meetings? Okay, not one, sucks. So we have to go to meetings and then meetings upon meetings, meetings upon meetings upon meetings, and so we're always going in this direction, that direction, this direction, that direction, this direction, and if we had time to actually focus, it'd be a bit different, wouldn't it? So we move slow, but yet these groups, they don't. They're innovative, they change their techniques. Now, don't get me wrong, they're not using like massively awesome zero days. I mean, nation states do, and some of these groups uh, you know, have been, been notorious for using uh, zero days, but it's a very small percentage, right? So they're using known tactics, techniques, and procedures that we all know, but why are they so successful if they're still using the same things that we deal with day in and day out? Let's talk about that. Let's not even go to nation states. I mean, you know, if your threat models are dealing with nation states right now, you're in the top, 0.0000001% of organizations and companies out there. You know, everybody's focusing on ransomware. Now your threat models may be nation states, but how are you looking at designing a threat model with, with an organization that has unlimited funding, uh, weaponization of tooling, continues to advance at a rapid rate? You know, there's a lot to talk about and discuss there. So when we look at adversary capabilities, today they move faster than our security programs. Does everybody agree? Does everybody here know every single piece of technology you have in your environment? No. It's not possible. So how do we shift the model from slow, but don't get me wrong, I'm not saying throw away your through your programs. It's, that's important. It's important to always get better with protection, with governance, getting your hand with better telemetry data, with improving in your environment, but how do we actually get better to move faster to help organizations? Now, before I, I give you the answer for that, again, it's not one security person to one, one thing, I was just, that was just a joke. Um, well, if you could pull that off, it'd be amazing. Um, but when you look at, at adversary capabilities, all they have to do right now is just modify their code in just a little bit to get around most of the detection criteria we have out there. And by the way, we know that you have security products as attackers. I'm, just, I'm playing the, the bad hacker right now. I'm gonna, I should have a hat. I should put the hat on when I need to be a bad person and then like, anyways, it's a good idea for the next one. Um, but I'm gonna play a bad hacker right now. When I'm going after an organization, if I'm any good, and when I say good, if I'm an average hacker, all I need to do is go to LinkedIn and look at the folks that work in your organization and say, hey, I'm an expert in CrowdStrike. I'm an expert in this EDR. I'm an expert in this. I have this SIM, and here's, by the way, when it was implemented. Here's we're doing a brand new rollout of this and probably not even installed yet. So I know from a, 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 an open source intelligence gathering perspective what your products and security stack are gonna most likely look like. So if I know that, 
then I need to make sure that my attacks and detections, or my attacks don't get any detections on it, right? So I'm gonna craft my attacks so that either A, doesn't get picked up, or B, I tell a story to your SOC analysts that make it look believable. One of my favorite ones to use, uh, and this works like every single time, but there's two, two of my favorite ones. I'll give you two, two freebies here that will give you a, almost 100%, well, it's been 100% success rate for the past like several years for me. And I'm giving you the secret right now. So if you wanna break into any company in the world, these are literally the two things you can do, okay? It's not, again, like hiring, you know, an army of hackers to develop zero data. Anyways, um, the first one that is, is one of my favorites is, is social engineering via text messages, okay? Well, data that's been done before, great. Does anybody know what happened in the Uber hack? Anybody know the, the, the details behind that one? That is my favorite use case. Research how the attackers broke into Uber. Like, literally own them, like, inside and out, everything. And, and Uber, by the way, has a dedicated security program. Dedicated folks working there, Fortune 500. They're a big company with a dedicated program, right? How did they get in to, and, and by the way, it was a bunch of 16 year olds, uh, first of all, so that's even better, right? Um, so a bunch of 16 year olds, I got a little, little thing here. Um, a bunch of 16 year olds literally broke into one of the largest companies in the world. Now how did they do that? Well, they bought credentials online from a, someone that had, so those are groups that just fish and, and, and sell user credentials online. So they had a valid user, a contractor that worked for Uber, that had VPN access, but Uber had multi-factor authentication, fantastic. So when, they, uh, when the attackers went to go log into the VPN concentrator, the user got a push notification saying, do you want to allow or deny this VPN coming from Cyprus? That doesn't seem right, I'm not from Cyprus. So the user did what they should have and they hit deny. Fantastic, right? It worked. Didn't report it. Tried it again within a few seconds. Why am I authenticating from Cyprus? No, deny. 16 times, hit deny. Never reported it. Guess what happened the 17th time? Hit approve. Fantastic. Man, uh, push notifications, worst thing that's ever been designed in multi-factor authentication. It is the weakest. I would take SMS over push notifications, period. The, the chances of SIM cloning versus someone hitting approve on accident, yes. high probability. Now here's the thing. Let's take some, some, some statistics. Does anybody know, and we, we track this, so if I'm doing a penetration test, company-wide trusted sec, thousands of customers, what do you think my success rate if I don't change my geolocation is on push notifications? What's my success rate for somebody hitting approve on accident? 57%. So over half the time I will get somebody that will approve without any pretext, without any advance notification, and without changing my location. Now if I change my location, so I change my location to being a general location of them, what's my success criteria? 74%, okay? So over three fourths of the time, I'm getting, you know, uh, success ratio on approved or denies. Now let me tell you my, my, my 100% guaranteed to work even on the administrators that run the multi-factor authentication solution. I'm six for six on that right now, by the way, for just hitting the admins that run literally the multi-factor authentication solution. Send them a text message the night before saying due to you know, recent updates and security advisories, we are in the process of, of, of upgrading, and again, if you do some OSINT, you can make it even more believable what SMS solution they're using, or what um, two-factor authentication solution they're using, but we're doing upgrades and you will need to repair your device tomorrow at one point in time. Please hit the allow uh, uh, notification coming from our corporate headquarters. 100%, works every single time. Here's the thing, social engineering, I'm not causing a sense of urgency right there, am I? So I'm not raising any flags. I'm saying, hey, there's gonna be an outage, you may need to do this. And then when they recall it in their brain, they're like, oh, yeah, I remember getting that notification, I probably need to do that. You're taking advantage of manipulation, social engineering, neuro-linguistic programming, in a sense, over, over text message, as well as the ability to really impact somebody. Again, it works on the, literally the SMS, or the two-factor authentication solution folks. So that's one. The second one, going after an organization that has a, a really advanced uh, monitoring detection program, SOC analysts, tier one, tier two, tier three, even outsourced. You have EDRs in place. You have your own customized detections. That's a good place to go to, right? Not very many of them out there, unfortunately, but there are, they are out there. My favorite one that has worked, again, 100% of the time, especially for remote code execution, as well as how I build my attacks, is that when I go after an organization, I have to understand that they're gonna see my, 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 uh, my attacks coming at them. So what's the story I want to tell them when they read that alarm? 
So what I usually do is I'll take like a PowerShell script for my command and control because PowerShell is heavily logged, right? We know this in most companies. And I'll take a, a PowerShell script from Microsoft, 2,000 lines of code, a legitimate one. I'll go on LinkedIn and I'll look at who their PowerShell admins are or Exchange admins or whomever, and I'll put a comment code on the top saying, you know, author so-and-so, here's my email address, please contact if any issues. This is for, you know, uh, pulling domain controller metrics for performance enhancements. And then I'll go like 1,500 lines down in the code, and I'll tuck my C2 in that. No one looks, ever, ever. I mean, I throw some really wicked stuff in there, like heavy obfuscation. I'll even put like, I'm hacking you right now. You know, we're just messing, you know, this is, the, this is a, a direct hack. You know, I'm an APT group. I'm gonna ransom all your stuff. Never, not once. Working that, been doing that for about five years, not one detection. Now, interesting enough, if you look at the tools that we have today, Defender, EDR, things like that, we're predominantly a signature-based industry. So we're looking for previously discovered TTPs. And the reason why that, that's good, by the way, I, I, I fully think that's amazing, because we're looking at previously defined data and attacks, and we're trying to apply that to our own environment. The problem we run into, though, is that not every environment is the same. In fact, no environment is the same. So something that, that is unique to you is a better detection than something that may have happened before in the past. Let me show you an example here, and this is a, 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 an attack that I did, or this is a, a C2 that I wrote called Trevor C2. I released it at uh, GERCON a number of years ago. And Trevor C2 is a um, command and control infrastructure that leverages you know, standard HTTPS for communications. Um, but what's interesting about it is, is um, it clones any website you want to, and it tucks the instruction sets uh, directly in an AES-256 encrypted uh, cipher that's tucked within the uh, post and get requests of the server itself. And if you're not a user agent, it just redirects you to the legitimate site. So it's very hard from a uh, defensive perspective to actually um, find out what's actually going on. But I published this code publicly, and if you go and download Trevor C2, you, you will get detected by CrowdStrike and Sentinel-1 and Windows Defender and those types of things, right? Funny story about this one, um, Windows Defender, there's, there's uh, some comic code I have in there saying, change these values, they are important to not be default or else you will be detected. If you change those values, you get around all of them. Literally every single one of them. Just through a couple minor, minor modifications of variable names. You, you can change like, I think it was um, streams, change streams to like streams two, good to go. Is that one change? So here's an example of getting remote code execution. I'm using an ISO. Uh, Russia likes to notoriously use that, so to send an email with an ISO, you open the ISO, I'm gonna kick off a law bin, uh, living off the land binary and script. I'm gonna use uh, RegSVR32, which also gets picked up by Windows Defender, but instead I'm gonna chunk the codes into a bunch of different variables, and it's gonna get around Windows Defender, as well as launch my C2, which I've rewritten to get around Windows Defender. And we run our code, we can see here, we get our C2, and I'm on a Windows 11 box running Windows Defender. No issues. Now, what's interesting about that is this attack took me less than, less than three minutes, right? So I just literally saw Registry 32 was getting picked up, so I chunked the command out. So Registry 32 um, is probably one of the most notorious living off the land binaries and scripts because it gives you the ability to download and execute. It's what we look for in an attacker's perspective. We, we call this binary, it goes out, it pulls our file down, and then it executes it, right? Well, Microsoft's like, well, instead of removing Registry 32 or locking it down, we're just gonna write a really crummy detection for it. And so if you just take Registry 32 and you use something else like Excel, for example, has download functionality. You can have Excel go and download a file. Have Excel download the file and then call Registry 32 without downloading it, gets around the detection criteria. Little minor changes that we can use as attackers. So the elephant in the room is, we're not actually right now technically focused on, uh, on the defending our organizations. We're bottled up with all this other stuff. Now don't get me wrong, that's our goal and our intent and we have good intentions, but we're really not focused on the right things that matter. So what is that? So what can we do? When you look at, and I'll use a bad term that, that we hate in security, uh, agile workflow, agile development, bad word, right? You know, we used to have this amazing thing called waterfall where we'd have like a freezing code and we can test, you know, before it goes into production and we knew everything that's going on. Now it's like, yeah, it's been there for like six months, we had no idea, right? You know, it's like, we'll figure it out after the fact. But we like, it's like Kubernetes, so it's like no one hacks that stuff anyway, so we'll be fine. And it's gonna be like an AWS, which, you know, again, no one hacks that, so we're fine. And then yeah, they absolutely do, but you know, it's, it's okay. And we have no visibility there, we no logs, because it's the cloud. Yeah, but it's magic, because it's the cloud, so it's secure, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, so we'll do Agile, right? So Agile is tough. What we have to look at is how do we become more Agile in our security programs? And not from a programmatic perspective, 
but the things that we can actually do that don't require substantial changes or to rely off of other organizations within the group to do. And that's detections. So the secret five are the five things that, that I recommend putting in right away. So when I got to Diebold, the first thing that I didn't do was start to do volume management. I didn't start to do uh, you know, penetration tests. I didn't start to do any of this stuff. My first thing was, for one, buying beer and pizza for the IT folks because I knew I was gonna get into some, some, some trouble um, and I wanted to make sure they're on my side. So beer and pizza always works uh, and, and whiskey. Um, but, <laughs> and, and so you know, what I started focusing on was what's my network look like? What are my assets? What do I have from a third party perspective and how do I get that data? Because I know that if I can centralize data and telemetry, I can start to react much faster. Now, if I have the data, I can start combing through that data and saying, hey, what do I need to start applying from a detection perspective that's mine? So if you install an EDR today, you have some great coverage, no question. Tactics, you, the MITRE attack frame, you get 100% coverage of, oh God, that's such a shit show. Um, but if you saw that, the, the whole MITRE thing got, got kind of blown out of proportion. But um, you know, EDRs are a good, solid way of getting information. Having visibility is a good, solid amount of information. Base rules and signatures are a good way of getting some, some basic uh, things. But it's not your own environment. So when I go into your, your company and I get remote code execution and I gain access to your system, I'm gonna get around those defaults. I'm gonna get around the, what we call commodity. So how do we look at our own data and say, what's unusual? We had a customer recently uh, where our threat hunting team found, uh, so we we're baselining uh, an organization. This will come into my, my concept here called the long tail. They, they were using um, uh, Microsoft's remote assistance tools for the IT help desk. So you know you have an issue, you remote in via Microsoft, you do your stuff, you fix it, everything's good, right? Well, we were looking through their data and saying, well, why do they have two instances of TeamViewer installed over here? That's weird, because that's not the baseline standard of the organization, but this company's not really good at configuration management, so maybe they had some kind of off-band process or they were helping somebody out or whatever, cool. But we investigated it, and we found out that two days prior, uh, they actually received phone calls from the help desk with thick, heavy Russian accents, um, asking them to download TeamViewer because they needed to fix you know, a couple of issues in their computer. Would your EDR pick that up? Hell no. It's legitimate software, it's TeamViewer, right? It's, it's an enterprise grade software. These are the types of things that you're not gonna be able to because attackers are smart. They're leveraging the same types of tools that we use for administration, using the same types of technology and corporate tools to do exactly what we're talking about here, to do these massive breaches. I guarantee you, and I happen to know for a fact, that MGM and Caesars have one of the more reputable EDRs that are out there today. Well, how do they get around that? Because they know they have that. So we just write our tools to go a little bit different. So if you're in the commodity space and all you're doing is taking a tool out of the box and putting it in your environment, you're not gonna make it. You're not gonna make the cut. Now you're at the point of uh, signature-based antivirus where you hope that you're not the first person to get hit. You have to understand what your environment looks like, the data that you have there, and start to build an understanding of what is legitimate behavior. There's a talk that I gave uh, with my friend from the FBI, Ryan McFarland. Uh, at the Information Security Summit, this is, this is early in my career. Now, this is, man, this has been 2005, 2006. So this is from, from the slide from there. And there's a book called The Long Tail, Why the Future of Business is Selling Less and More. And they come up with this concept called The Long Tail, which is understanding noise, essentially. We deal with a lot of noise, false positives. Uh, have you ever been to a SOC and they're like, you know, they, they, they get like thousands of thousands of alarms and the one that they actually need to care about is also false positive, but they, they missed it because they've seen so many other crappy alarms that they just miss those specific areas because there's so much noise. We have to focus on limiting the noise and focusing on the things that are important to us. Like a good example, li living off the land binders and scripts. Take every single one of the LawBass projects and say, do any of those run in the context of a normal user account with network connections? You have that visibility, like, oh crap, no, they don't. So if we ever see RegSVR32 communicate out to the internet via a normal user account, that's probably an issue. Or Markov chaining, parent-child process relationships. Why is Outlook spawning, you know, sub-process of command.exe or PowerShell.exe or RegSVR32 or, you know, uh, MSHTA or CBD or CSC, you know, uh, Mavinjack, all of these that run DLL32, another one. Um, why are they spawning those processes? That's an unusual behavior in our environment. When you have a access to the data, you can start to apply very specific data models that are specific to your organization. And let me tell you, every time I get detected as an offensive person, a hacker, it's because of those detections. I have no idea what I'm going into because I'm blind because I, you don't have commodity. 
You don't have the one-to-one -one detections. You have something different. I don't know what that is. I got busted one time. Uh, we do what are called red, red team engagements, but they're called no notice. And it's where we, uh, it, these are for like some of the best security programs I've ever seen. And there's, there's a couple out there that are just really hard for us to get into. Uh, and, it's, and it's actually a bit of an ego hit because like the past few, uh, they're so good that they, they busted us in early stages. And they're all like clapping that they beat trust at second. We're all crying in the background like F these guys, we're gonna get them next time. Um, you know, we appreciate them, we like them, it's amazing, but it's adversarial in the sense that we wanna own them and then they wanna defend against us. Well, we were definitely winning in this last one, but, um, but a good example of, of making it your own, this is a, such a stupid, simple one. Uh, you have Active Directory groups, right? In both in Azure and, and, and within AD. So you have these groups, just based on title alone, they went through just titles of all of their employees and whether or not they had a technical sounding job or a non-technical sounding job. So you had technical and non-technical, just based on position title, that's it. Technical, non-technical. How long did that take in your organization just looking at that title? Maybe a day, two days, okay. And then what they did is they said, well, hey, if we got a non-technical employee issuing technical commands like command prompts and things like that, trigger an alarm for us to investigate. So we're doing this no notice, and uh, the way that it works is that we'll either use like a, a, a exploit that comes out within you know, a six month period and use it against them so that we can weaponize it and then you know, take advantage of maybe not doing patch management, and we go for them and we try to, try to attack them. Well, in this case, we actually found a zero day on our own, disclosed it, found a zero day that gave us remote code execution on their boxes, on one of, one of the machines. And we have our own C2 um, that still hasn't been detected for over the past five years, which is awesome. Um, and so we have our C2 that uses undocumented deserialization techniques for remote code execution and memory, all high-end nation state stuff, right? It's cool to say like, hey, I've got the same capabilities as a nation state. Um, so we get all this stuff, we do this magical stuff on a machine, we get a box, we're, we're in. We're all high-fiving each other because we just owned this company, now we gotta get access to the rest of this stuff. Those bastards flagged us on a non-technical ma machine because we were executing technical commands. Son of a bitch. Like what the heck, you know, all that work and effort, six months worth of work, and we're all like high-fiving, you know, we're like going out for bourbon and drinks, and all of a sudden, we get busted, we get booted out, we're like, no, no, it's just a glitch, we, our code was wrong, you know? and then they call us two minutes later, like, yeah, we got you guys, I'm like, ah, oh, man. So, talking about the noise, look in the left here, you have all this stuff that's gonna be your high commodity, so let's just say remote assistance is gonna be your high commodity noise. When we focus more on the lesser noise pieces, those are the areas that we wanna focus on. What are the deviations of behavior within organizations? A good example, why is a regular user now spraying laterally across the environment, Uber? So the, the story past Uber is once they got access to the VPN concentrator, the attackers technically had domain user credentials, right? Because they had a valid user account there on the network. So they start spraying SMB, which by the way, highly recommend disabling RPC and SMB from regular user context directly to your infrastructure. Um, you know, not a great thing but they're able to find a file share that had a PowerShell script in it. That PowerShell script happened to have the administrator password for the Phycotic password action management solution for the entire company. Oh God, that's not good. Now people were surprised by that. I'm like, that happens every day in every single company literally. You have a script somewhere that has a domain admin on it or something probably uh, that will allow an attacker into your environment. That happens during a test. But the indicators that happen up there, a regular VPN machine sweeping the network on, you know, 135, 445, probably not a great idea, right? Visibility is a big thing. The noise that isn't necessarily a normal thing that you see every day. So we gotta focus on fast detection, things that we can implement in our environment that are for us to be able to add new telemetry data. Uh, and, and add new sources as we go along, we find new. Cloud, great example. Does anybody here feel like they have better visibility in cloud than they do their on-prem? We have one, kind of have a hand there, okay, it's like a half hand. Interesting, it's good. It's a lot of work and effort to get to that point. It's possible, but difficult. So we need to look at how do we get better visibility and then apply that logic to it. Another good example, you know, when you start getting into parent-child process relationships, there's so much, you know, treasure trove of data. How do you think ASR works? Tax service reduction in Microsoft. Parent-child process relationships, the most part, right? You know, looking at, hey, why is this process spawning this process to kick off this that has never communication? That's not normal. Those things make a big difference in our environment of what's unique, what's not, what's an attacker. Deception is my favorite thing, and we don't use this at all in our industry. Like, I've run into maybe 10 companies in the past 10 years that have deception. Why are we not doing this? This is like the coolest thing that you could ever do in your environment and it's fun as hell and no one even knows it's there. High fidelity alerts, low false positives, this shit, sorry, this stuff 
scares the crap out of me as an attacker. I am terrified if I find a deception technique in an environment. Because now I know I'm walking on a landmine. I'm like, oh, nope, no, I'm just, I'm just gonna chill, I'm gonna go get a beer real quick. It's scary because I don't know what's real and what's not. So you create Honeycreds where you have an administrator account and there's a, a, there's a link, and I'll, I'll share my slides. There's a link in there to a PowerShell script that you can run that basically does the, the command.dc uh, command slash you know, net only. So it allows you to store password essentially in memory without having to authenticate to the domain. So you can run a PowerShell script, Let's create this small tiny PowerShell script as a login script to your regular users, make it look like it's the king domain admin, old school printer scanner domain admin that you know, is, is in the description that says legacy you know, account, we're trying to phase off of this. Chain, make the password something insanely large, you know, 7,000 character password, burn it afterwards. And then you have this, this you know, run as command that injects passwords into memory that looks like this domain admin. If I'm going on a box and I compromise it, I'm like, oh my God, this is the easiest day ever. I just landed a domain admin. Dude, look at this. Let's, let's go celebrate, let's go get some beers. I'm gonna, then I'm gonna personate that, I'm gonna go try to authenticate, and you're gonna get the only failed login attempt that you should ever see in that environment, 100% predictability that that is an attacker, and what machine it came from. Now, deception, you don't want to be firing off very often. It means they've gotten rid of, around all of your detections, doing some amazing stuff, and now you're running into those. But there's so many different examples of how you can focus on deception in your environment. Uh, systems are okay. I like Honey Systems. If they're strategically placed in environments, because you can see people souping the network, maybe you put some vulnerabilities in there. But like, when you have access to your own endpoints, you start putting treasure troves of data in there, like you know, a, uh, an SSH script that you know, has an SSH username and password in it. Wait for someone to log into that box, right? You know, you, there's so many ideas that you come up with, and this is like the fun stuff to me. This is like getting into the mind of an attacker and taking every step of the way that they do from initial access to privates escalation to lateral movement to all the other post-exploitation centers, including exfiltration of data, in cloud too, by the way, and you're literally designing something that they have, they have, they're gonna wanna go after. SPN accounts are another great example. Service principal, name, service principal names in Kerber roasting. There's literally an event ID that gets generated when somebody queries that account. So you create an account with a massive ass password you know, that no one's ever gonna break. You wait for that event ID to generate for that user account, you know you have somebody Kerber roasting. It's like stuff that we can implement right now that's no impact to our systems whatsoever that no one even knows exists that literally has a monumental impact on identifying an attacker. Like if I was in an organization, Threat hunting and deception be like the two things I focused on. So much value there, so much information, so many things that you could whittle down. So here's some example use cases. Uh, enable command line auditing, which is 4688. Most of the adversaries are gonna be using net, net one.exe, who am I, ipconfig, system info, task kill, VSS admin, host name, WMIC. You know, they're gonna be using a lot of commands to enumerate what box they're on. By the way, the, the command that snagged us on that, that, that company that we hacked was host name. Host name. It was, and it, by the way, it wasn't a command line, it was actually calling the API. And they snagged us on that. Seriously, like what the hell? I'm still, I'm still mad at that, I can't sleep sometimes. Take your regular user accounts, so Dave, map those to the Living Off the Land Binaries and Scripts project. The Lawbass project, uh, one of our folks at TrustSec runs it, uh, Odvar Mo. But look at normal legitimate applications and binaries that are running under the context of a user account. This will help. Parent-child process relationships, couple that with network connections. Sysmon, I love Sysmon. Sysmon is a fantastic way, free tool for Microsoft, Mark Rosanovich's team from SysInternals, uh, exposes what's called kernel level event log tracing for Windows or ETW. Pipe that into Security Onion, you got your cooking, man. And there's, uh, it's, it's a, a flexible language saying and or operators, regexes, you name it, you can do um, image load type sevens, which are you know, DLL importing. So you can look at things like Mimikatz, for example. You see you know, Volklight at DLL uh, injecting into you know, a, a system level process. You know something's going on right there. So there's so many detections you can write just by, by getting some information from Sysmon. I love Sysmon. That is like my framework for getting good information from a Windows box to deploy across the board. And you know, there are some things you're gonna have to map from like a, how do you update the config and stuff like that, but all handled very well through Active Directory or group policy. Split out groups based on technical and non-technical, uh, looking for technical commands, and, and deception. That tool that I talked about, uh, Fuzzy Security wrote this a number of years ago, um, it's invoke run as. So the reason I, you do that in PowerShell, by the way, is it's calling the, the API. If you just do the command line, it's gonna require a prompt back to go and do it. This does it without the prompt. So if you're gonna do a login script with a master domain admin that you know, someone's gonna go after from an enticing perspective via Mimikatz, also, by the way, cache credentials, another good way, right? Cache, cache stores, things like that. Again, ways that you could do deception in your environment. 
So the concept today, in wrapping things up a little bit, is that we have to be fast, and we can be fast at detection. We can be fast at implementing new things in our environment that doesn't require a change control process, that doesn't require massive amount of IT spend. We can do it with tools that are available publicly. We can do it with amazing products like Security Onion. You can do it with things that are across this board. Sysmon, another great example. Or if you have an enterprise-grade solution, that's your two. You can do that as well, and, and you just focus on quick. You have to have a process that looks at detection engineering. You look at a process that says, hey, there's a new attack that's out there. How do we get into our environment? I'll tell you right now, um, one of the big things at Binary Defense, we're an MDR provider. The big thing that was always been for me, we finally have it. It's, it's taken me years to get to this point. It's my baby now at this point. It's what I've always wanted is that our detection engineering process is integrated into our threat intel team and our threat hunting teams as well. So whenever something new comes out, literally in less than an hour, we have a detection pushed out to our entire customer population using different technologies. That's effing awesome. That's hard, by the way, to do that, but it's awesome. We're, net, we're there from an agile perspective. We apply data models directly to you know, thousands of customers across different platforms and have detections for all of them in that place based on that specific attack. You can do that in your environment too. Doesn't mean you have to do that, but getting more coverage, the more coverage and effectiveness you have on the varying stages of, ta of attacks and techniques that, are, that attackers are using, the better you're gonna be to find these, these attackers out there. And by the way, most of us use the same stuff over and 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 over. Doesn't matter what C2 it is. They're gonna somehow try to you know, move laterally from machine, right? So they do some sort of privilege escalation or they start sweeping the network or they start looking at file shares. You know, they probably do some sort of Mimikatz, they probably try to do Kerberos thing, they probably do local, local link multicast name resolution protocol, MBNS, responder slash invade. They look for credentials. By the way, another great deception tool, or this way of doing deception, do a, a, a PowerShell script that tries to map a drive with a illegitimate username and password, which uses LLM and R. And look for those failed login attempts, right? You know, so these are ways that you can start to shift the discussion of attackers finding that one thing to the attacker's gonna mess up in my environment and we now have a defensible approach while we build all this other stuff out there. And the Browns, again, aren't a great example, but it has a logo on there. I um, just wanted to show the logo again. But the best defense is really understanding the offense. And if we can move fast on what these adversaries are doing, we got an amazing chance to disrupt that. But it comes down to us being able to move pretty damn quick, pretty damn fast, and out of the politics of our normal organization workflow but we can do it. Last thing I wanna hit on is, is, for me, it's always been about making a difference. Uh, what type of impact I could have on whatever I'm doing. I guarantee you, you build something like this in your environment, you're literally gonna impact that company in, in tenfold ways in the future because you now have the ability to respond to these attacks much faster. Dwell time is everything. You know, if an attacker has two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks in your environment, you're screwed, right? Um, if they have one hour, two hours, don't care. Not gonna be much, right? So if you can identify them earlier and earlier and earlier in the stages, reduce your damage, you got a fighting chance for everything. But just wanna say thank you all again for having me. Uh, Doug, the whole team there, Phil, congratulations on all the weight loss, man. Uh, it's amazing as it does from a health perspective, but seriously, uh, grateful to be here uh, at Security Onion. Appreciate you all. Feel free to tag me anytime at Hacking Dave on social media. If you want my email address, it's literally hackingdave at trustedtech.com. Again, you own your own company, you can write whatever title you want to. Um, always happy to, to reach out and, and talk to you folks anytime, but thanks again so much for having me, thanks.